let me tell you something. There's an act of faith here. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end. Do you believe that tonight? Is that presumptuous or is that faith? When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and you go, yeah, I believe that. Is that faith or is that being presumptuous? So what I'm telling you is that what you know of being in Christ will affect how you live. This is part nine. And um, my gut feeling is we'll maybe, we'll maybe go to part 11 or part 12. I don't see us going for hundreds of weeks on this subject. What is revival? Um, okay, so we're not looking at revival tonight from a personal perspective. Um, we spent quite a few weeks looking on, at personal revival. And we find out there's three types of revival in the main. Although you could kind of split it into subsets or whatever. Cameron, what's the three types of revival? Personal, national, and um, yeah, I think in the church. Okay. So, yeah, there's personal revival, there's collective revival, where we all get a touch. Amen? Would you agree there's a difference between you getting a touch and all of us getting a touch? Would, can you see the difference? And do you see the difference between us getting a touch and our nation getting a touch? Would you agree there are three different types of revival? So, I'm looking at, um, Ron, could you help us tonight just read this? We um, want to look at collective revival here tonight. From a church perspective, revival starts with the re revitalization of the spiritual life of the church and results in the ingathering of lost souls to the kingdom of God. So, last week we looked at some of the things that would be signs of God moving in our midst. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper, but I'll, we're still on the same passages. So I still want to use these passages tonight. Uh, Kyle, would you read these passages? You don't need to read the Hebrew um, stuff tonight. Uh, what you'll find is the word for revive is the same in all these passages. Psalm 85, 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. For thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with whom also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Habakkuk 3.2 declares, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. Okay. So, I want you to kind of think collective tonight, okay? I want you to think of God stirring us up to such a degree that we could consider this a revival in our church. Ultimately, um, I would say there's different degrees of revival, okay? And I would say there's different degrees of revival in your personal walk, would you agree? I mean, you, you, there, there, you could be, okay, we covered it a few weeks ago in church. Um, it talks about the river coming out of the temple. What were the different degrees of the river? The ankle, knees, waist, hips, and then waters to swim in. So would you agree that even in that illustration, what is the temple represented above? Christ. What's the river represented above? Okay. So the Holy Spirit comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, so I'm sure you would agree that there's different levels that we can actually be swimming in tonight. So you could still be in revival and be up to your ankles. Would you agree? Right, yeah. So think about it. A baby Christian. A baby Christian gets saved and suddenly their whole life changes. Would you agree that even though the water's up to their ankles maybe, they're still in revival? So I would like you to think about that tonight, that re there's degrees to revival, and the depth of that revival is very determined upon yourself. Um, and I say that because 
ultimately, God has given that river for us to swim in. Um, but it's up to us the degree to which we go into it. Okay, so this is what I wrote tonight. And um, Local church revival starts when the congregation as a whole starts to not only grasp who they are in Christ, but then start to function in that. Okay, so we're talking about collective revival here. Um, if we are a solid church and we're preaching the truth and we are growing collectively, we should know who we are in Christ. Would you agree? Who are you in Christ tonight? Your beloved? Ron, who are you in Christ tonight? I'm his child. I'm his very loved child. Amen. Amen. Who are you in Christ tonight? I'm, there's... A lot of answers here we could give, but we're, we're in Christ. So what does that mean to you tonight, to be in Christ? Chosen? New creation? Redeemed? You know, it's a wonderful thing to intellectually kind of know this, because there's churches out there, be under no illusion, they preach a false gospel. They, they, they don't know what their standing in Christ is. There's legalistic churches that they think by they, them doing an A to Z that they'll be good enough. Will that A to Z be good enough to help their standing before God? No. Why not, Jesse? Exactly. I'm here tonight to tell you but the fact we're in Christ. It's in Him and through Him that we actually have the ability to do good works. So if you're a genuine believer, you will want to do good works, but not to earn your salvation, but because you just want to please Him. Amen? So, um, so the first point I made here tonight was that the congregation starts to not only grasp who they are in Christ, but then they start to function in that. So I have a question for Ron tonight. Okay, the revelation that you have, okay, um, about being His child, Him being your father, Him being a faithful father, and one thing I love about Ron is he consistently will talk about that. And I hope until he meets the Lord or until that trumpet goes, that he always continues to share that. But what is the difference between knowing that, knowing that, but then walking in it? To me, it's a huge difference. Because to know it... It's just an intellectual game as far as I'm concerned. To know it is a relationship with him that you just know he's got you in his hands. You're safe and secure in him. Mm -hmm. And that whatever he tells you to do, you know he's going to be there for you on it. Mm -hmm. Do I walk there? No. But I know that it's the truth. I see it revealed in scripture over and over again that he's there for his children. That's Old Testament or New Testament. He's there for them. He just he just has this enormous love for us that we fail to realize. Uh, we think it's... Uh, we, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. We, we look at the Bible, we look at the Old Testament, and even at the New Testament, we feel like he's somebody who's demanding and wanting us to do all of these things. And we see, if you look at the Old Testament, you see him constantly, constantly, constantly working with his people, working with them, trying to help them to get past their shortcomings and their failings. He's loving them. And then finally they push the envelope so far that he has to take action against them. In the New Testament, he's paid the whole price for sin, so therefore he's, he's wanting us to see that truth that is there. And this is why I sometimes say we look at the Scripture and we see commands that are not commands. They're statements that are, this is what I have already done for you. It's not something that you have to do. And in that relationship, when you see that, you say, wow, Lord, you really, really care for me and really love me and you want me to... Just walk in and understand that and not and not feel insecure. I've tried to share with some people the idea, the concept 
that it's almost like there's a big table out there, and this is a very poor example, but a big table out there, and that table represents my salvation, and I'm on that table. We're all on that table table we're solid and secure we mess up and he has to come along and sweep the debris off the edge but we are still on that table solid and secure and that's when we can really get to know just how much he really really loves us amen ron amen curtis you mentioned that you're in christ you're beloved of the lord what is that what effect does that revelation have upon you experientially? To know that you're loved of Him, you're not hated of Him. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, uh, I guess it changes my whole outlook on life. Uh, uh, I always try to, um, even when, when tough things come, and they do come, like I feel like we always have, I just don't know how... Um, we could ever be a negative people. I mean, I don't know how a person could ever not be positive, mm -hmm. um, even though you might be going through it. Um, th there's just so much to be thankful for mm -hmm. as a Christian, um, to know the Lord, the fact that He knows you, you have a home in heaven. Uh, the worst thing they could do to you is is take you out, but yet that's that's the greatest thing because we're going to see Him someday. So mm -hmm. I just... Um, to me, uh, life is always, uh, I've always looked at life pretty positive, but now being a Christian, it's like I, I have nothing to complain about. I mean, I, I could never sit here and complain and, and, and whine because I know how blessed I am. I mean, I, we are so fortunate. Uh, and anybody who doesn't know that, if you're a Christian, man, you, you need to know that. Uh, we are so fortunate in everything that, that God has done and what Christ has done for us. So uh, to me, it's just... Uh, it's made me definitely just super thankful, mm -hmm. uh, never complain, uh, never whine, and uh, just, man, always always be positive and give thanks. Amen. Well, oh, go ahead, Cherry. And I have a point I would just want to oh, share. If you make no, 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 go ahead because I'll remember it. I, w I was just thinking of a practical example mm -hmm. of being in Christ. There's a scripture that says, there is now therefore no condemnation. Yes. And one of my heart's desires is to share Christ with everybody. Mm -hmm. Going through the Walmart checkout. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't care where I'm at. I just yeah. want to share Christ. And I, I, I've not always done it right. Mm -hmm. I confess I haven't. Mm -hmm. And the other day I was sharing with a family member the experience that I had with my dad. Mm -hmm. And the family member said... Wow, wasn't that better than the way you used to do it? You used to hit people over the head. And you know what? All I had for this person was love because yeah. there's no condemnation in Christ. God loves me even when I mess up. And yeah. I am so joyful in that to know yeah. that if I did hit somebody over the head with, with the word of God, my heart was not to do it in yeah. that type of way, but because I love them. Absolutely. Well, here's, my, here's a thought. A cri here's a criticism that I've heard over this last 10 years that obviously one of the wonderful things I feel God showed me over the, over the years has been how that he is faithful. That there is assurance in Jesus Christ. That we don't walk by fear, we walk by faith. And when people ask you, do you believe you're going to make it to heaven? You say, yeah. And it just says, whom the Father has given me, none have I lost but the son of perdition. And they say, you know what the criticism is when you say that? Well, do you not think that if you really believe that, then you'd just go out and just live like a devil? Anybody ever heard that criticism? Yeah, you're presumptuous to think that you're safe in the Lord. But let me tell you something. There's an act of faith here. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end. Do you believe that tonight? Is that presumptuous or is that faith? When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and you go, yeah, I believe that. Is that faith or is that being presumptuous? So what I'm telling you is that for me being in Christ and what I know that I'm beloved of him, and when I mess up, he's got many, many ways of correcting me. And he does, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. 
I'm just telling you that, so my thought tonight is that your, what you know of being in Christ will affect how you live. There's Christians that spend their whole life walking in condemnation. And the reason they're walking in condemnation is this. They don't have a revelation of who they are in Christ. Okay, so my first point tonight is this. Curtis, I'll get back to you in a second, and Cameron. I, I, okay, so, uh, well, hey, we'll go real quick, guys. Just, uh, Curtis, uh, no, I, I want to go on to the next point because these three things kind of flow together, but go ahead. Well, I just wanted to share it. So uh, I think, you know, <laughs> I've heard that before too, what Sherry's talking about, like people saying that. And, and I would say, uh, yeah, there are there are some people maybe out there that... Uh, I can't remember even what the group is, but you know, the, I hate, I hate fags or, you know, gays and mm-hmm. there's that group. But so there are those and that's a real thing. But, uh, I'd say the more majority, uh, of it typically, uh, comes from uh, so that other person is probably convicted or just wants to, wants you to shut up about the Lord. Like they don't like you speaking out about the Lord. So they'll say things like, Oh, you're judging me, or uh, you know, I've heard a lot that yeah, you're you're hitting you're hitting them over the head with the Bible, or you know, I've been told oh, you wear your faith too much out on your sleeve. But mm-hmm. it's it's really, uh, I think, the enemy trying to just stifle what what God's doing because God's using you uh, to be that voice and to speak the truth. Mm-hmm. And then I know you need to check yourself, you know, sometimes and make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. But I think the majority of the time. Uh, it's honestly the enemy trying to just silence you mm-hmm. and trying to discourage you. Correct. So I would just reject, I would reject the majority of that because people, I've heard that a hundred times and so has everybody else. Oh, you're judging me. And, and it's really just, they don't want to hear the truth. The truth hurts and it really pierces their heart because they know that they know that they know that you're right deep down. Correct. And they want to reject that. Amen. Cameron, real quick. One of the ma- um, one big thing that really came to me about what, what God thinks of me, thinks of us, He's making a masterpiece out of us. Are we finished? No. But in the end, we're going to be a beautiful masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Praise God for that. Amen. So tonight, guys, I want you to see where we're going here with this. Step one is, would you agree you get a revelation of who you are in Christ and salvation? You start to know who, you start to know truth, and then you start to walk in truth. Would you agree? Okay. So when that's happened in our congregation, that's a touch of revival. But what should happen then after that is, this should result in us giving God His due, and then ministering onto the needs of the brethren. And I say that because I'm talking about if we can't minister on to the needs within this house, how are we going to reach the needs out there? Amen. See, I think, I think sometimes we think, okay, we get saved and then suddenly the next step for the church or there's a move of God in the church is, is out there. It starts to happen in here where people start to see, wow, these guys are real. They love each other. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I want you to see that tonight, that, that there is that where you, we start to um, move in the revelation of God. Okay, so we're not just knowing the revelation. We start to move in that revelation. But again, the next stage is where we give God his due. What is God do, Kyle? What, what is due to our God as a congregation? What should we give him? Well... He's, he's do everything, but everything you ask, he's do obedience. Um, he doesn't demand our life, but he's he's really do our life because he's saved us out of his grace. Um, certainly, I think he's do everything everything that he asks us to do, which is different for everybody. Yeah. Yes. So there's a collective here. So. There's things that God wants from us as a congregation. Okay? Um, When we come into His presence, it's been talked about tonight, we give Him thanks. We give Him praise. We give Him worship. I think Kyle mentioned we give Him ourselves. Okay? Lord, you've got me. 
And that's somewhere, some, a place that we don't really want to go where we say, I surrender all. Back in the old days, I remember there was a lot of that where people just give themselves. They would go to the altar and they would just say, you've got me. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, you've got me. Now, sometimes that's easier as a single man than it is as a married man. Okay? Because I remember as a single man, like I was like, I was ever ready. Do you want me to go to Switzerland? I went to Switzerland. You want me to uh, go over to England? I'll go to England. And then suddenly you become a pastor. You become a married man with kids. And it's just not as easy just to, to understand. But God works within your circumstances. But I'm telling you tonight that God is looking something of us. And I'm telling you, it's not enough of you getting your revelation and walking in it. Then you have to give him what he wants from you. And we're all unique in here, but I believe that as God's moving in the house, that we all should start to be them living sacrifices before him. So if he needs somebody to do a visit in this town tonight, there's somebody who's going to be available for that. Or in your village or your town. So I'm just telling you that there's stages. And I say the next stage after the first stage is that we start to meet the needs in this house. The next thing, the last thing here that I have is that then leads to ministry outside of the four walls with the lost. So I want to just for a few moments just consider us. So God's moving in this house. What, what, how do we meet the needs of each other? What do we do? Where do we start? Okay. Well, I want to start with this passage here. And um, Ron, would you read this tonight? This, I just put this in my notes today. So. This was just something that God led in my heart. 1 Corinthians 20, 12, 25 through 27, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay, so anybody got any thoughts on that verse? Whenever you read it, what do you think? Go ahead, Curtis. No jockeying for position, essentially. Like, uh, you know, like I, I appreciate, you know, whether it's Kyle's gift or Pastor Paul or, or Ron or whatever. Like, I'm not trying to be, um, I'm not trying to take your spot. You know, like I, I just appreciate all the gifts that we have and we're not jockeying for position. Like there's no division. He talks about division in there, schism, uh, no division in the body. Uh, there's not somebody in here jockeying for position. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're all just have that, just that humble attitude. Like, man, I'm so glad to be a part of the body of Christ. Like what an honor it is to be a part of this body here in Walt Hill, Nebraska. Amen. Elijah. Expanding on, on this point, though, is that, yeah, also with that, like no like gaps or splits or schisms in a way like where we're united as well. We're not like, you know, in our own little cubicles doing our own little thing. We may not be jockeying for one another. That is something that we sometimes do as Christians. But on top of that, there's just times we don't want a fellowship. You know, our, our flesh can be very stubborn at that. Or, or sometimes we need to be more open with one another. And, I, and you know, I'm saying all these things. I'm not the best at it at all. I fall short all the time. But like even being open, like becoming united, that becoming united um, implies opening up. And that's something that uh, no schism. We start knowing one another and we're not strangers anymore. Amen. There's something big stands out to me in this. And, and this is really what grabbed me today is that when one suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Now, help me with that tonight. I know how I feel what it means. Russ, when you read that, and then we'll go to Sherry. Um, what does that make you, you know, when one suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. What, what, what does that say to you? Practically, just as a believer. just. I think, I think when you see someone suffering or hurting, you know, how do you say, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, you should see it with the eyes of Christ. You should see that 
you know, that that person hurt, that person is hurting and, mm -hmm. you know, what can I do or what can the body do to help that person? And then yes. when that person it, some that is being honored, you know, you, you should be joyful and, and, you know, thank God that God used that person and say they're being honored for something that they did, you know, for God. And then we should all be happy about that because they're using their gift, the gift that God has given them. So just, I guess. No, that's good. Um, Sherry, and then Curtis, and then Ron. I just think of when Ava shared that she had her baby girl, and we all got to rejoice with her. Yes. Amen. Um, Curtis. <laughs> I think um, that we're so, uh, we're so connected and intertwined uh, that it's impossible to not feel the pain of that other believer. Like if they're yeah. going... Like if Christine's, you know, I know she's dealing with her house and stuff. Like, I think we should all feel that a little bit, you know. And if she's distressed, we should, because we're so tight knit, you know, as a body, as as, as fellow believers, we're so close and connected and uh, a part of one another's lives that we are truly affected when one of us feels pain or one of us mm -hmm. is going through maybe the worst, you know, a difficult time or whatever it may be. Ron. I hope this doesn't sound negative because it's not meant that way. But I think it's a lack of love. I see it in myself primarily. I look at myself and say, I don't have enough love for everybody. Mm -hmm. I haven't got enough love of God. Because mm -hmm. if I could love God more, I could love everybody else a whole lot more. Because mm -hmm. my being able to love God means I'm receiving more from Him all the time. So I don't receive enough not that he's giving, he's given it all. I'm just not receiving it. And therefore, I don't have enough love for one another to have that compassion. Mm -hmm. And I see that fault in myself. And I'm not sure if, if it isn't scattered throughout the whole body, that there's just not enough love. And I think part of that comes from, I was talking Saturday with some people sitting at a table, and I was thinking, man, I don't know these people. I don't really know these people because the more we shared with one another, the more I felt closer to them, the more, therefore, I would have love for them. And I, I, I don't know what the solution is on that. I just know I would like to get to know some of these people better than what I do now because I'm probably in that group where Elijah talks about that kind of just pulls back and sits all by himself. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mike? I just know that <clears throat> this is a family. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say it so many times. We're a family. Mm -hmm. When somebody's missing, you know, we miss them. Mm -hmm. And when I was in other churches before this, I was Lutheran. I grew up Lutheran, went through the catechism and all that stuff. But it was a dead duck church, really. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody ever taught me that I needed to be born again. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to hell and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. But in this church, you know it. You know, and, and like you say, everybody is a family. We're a family member. And, mm -hmm. I mean, we pretty much know each other's names and everything. Yeah. I got to admit, in, in the other churches, I didn't really know. I had mm -hmm. a few people I knew, but not majority. And it, when I went, <clears throat> it was all phony. Mm -hmm. I went to church because yeah. I thought I had, I, needed, I had to go to church. Yeah. Not because I wanted to. So let me just develop this, okay? Because I feel this passage tonight is telling us something that I believe is revival. When you feel what your brother and sister is going through, that is a sign of revival because you, you're really you're having the compassion of Christ. Okay? Would you agree that when we talk to him, he's not like, oh, here, here Russ goes again, or here Cindy goes again. Oh, I wish they would just get, get that prayer out of the way. Do you think, is that the, the way the Lord is with us? Whenever we're hurting, whenever we're going through dark times, is he like, oh boy, here Peter goes again. I mean, I've told him this a thousand times and here he, he's doing it. Is that the, what the Lord's doing to you, Peter? What does the Bible say? That the Lord is not untouched by the feeling of your infirmities. You see, there's somewhere in here, there's something, there's deeper waters for each of us. I think we're all guilty of selfishness. Well, do you know what? I've got my little family. I'm going to look after them. I don't care about this brother, this sister. I'm okay, Jack. 
And I'm telling you, it's part of living in the day we live in. That's normal Christianity today. Normal Christianity is what you're describing, even in born-again churches today. I talk to believers from Sioux City, and they tell me they don't even know. They, they go in, they hear a good message, but they don't know they don't know their brethren. I'm talking about, I sat, uh, I, w- I was at a concert last night, Luke was playing his instrument, and I sat bas- behind a pastor. So, listen, I talk to people when I'm out there, okay? I talk to, you know, I like to know where people are. If they go to a church, tell me about your church. But I'm not trying to say, hey, we're a better church than you. I really want to know what's it like out there. What is the spiritual temperature out there? And one of the things I find is believers aren't getting the fellowship that the depth of fellowship that they once had. Where they used to feel like there was a depth of fellowship. Now it feels like it's all superficial. Oh, good to see you this morning, Ron. God bless you. Oh, and then he shares a problem with me and I'm like, oh, I'll be praying for you. And I'll tell you, I get to Kyle and I forgot about that prayer. Huh? You see, one thing, here's a little nugget. And this is what, when, when somebody says to me, would you pray for me? I actually don't wait. A, I, I actually, I try and pray right away. Or if it's on the phone, I say, I'm, I'm going to pray for you because the thing I hear is saying, I'm going to pray for you. And then I totally forget it. And it's just like a, um, hey, all the best, brother. It's just like a greeting nearly. Would you agree? Yeah. Hey, I'll pray for that there. And you know, rightly, they're not going to pray and you're not going to pray for their need. So I, I felt convicted of that years ago. And I've had good preachers say to me, whenever somebody says that, pray right away. Either pray on the phone with them right away, or in person right away, or make a point of writing it down and pray, doing the actual prayer. But what I'm talking about tonight is real empathy. I think we need to empathize more with each other. I think we need to identify more with each other. And I, I honestly believe, and don't ask me why we're on this passage here tonight, but I'm telling you, when we're talking about revival, this is part of it. I don't think we're fully there, but we're, I do feel as a church that we have, we have a desire to go there. Uh, Elijah? Just a real quick point. It's like that verse, because if we're, doing, if we're loving one another, he says they will know we are Christians by our love. You know, yes. It's for one another. It's, it's, it's from that that they're like, I want that. You know, we start producing the goods within, within ourselves. We start, they start seeing that and they want to become part of that. They want to partake in that. Okay, so here, here's, we're going to go on a, a quick journey tonight. Okay, so can you see here in this passage that we have the care for one another? Do you read that? Okay, so there's the first one, care for one another. Okay, uh, Kyle, would you read these tonight? And we can go through them slowly because I have a question after each one. John thirteen thirty four, Love one another. Okay. How does that look to you? Love one another. We'll, we'll just, we'll not answer that. We'll just uh, maybe ask that question after each one. Romans twelve ten. Prefer one another. How does that look to you? Prefer one another. Romans fifteen seven. Receive ye one another. Same question. Galatians five thirteen. Serve one another. Yep. Ephesians four three. Forbear one another. Ephesians four thirty two. Forgive one another. First Thessalonians four eighteen. Comfort one another. First Thessalonians five eleven. Edify one another. Romans five fourteen. Admonish one another. Oh, we like that one, don't we? <laughs> Hebrews three thirteen. Exhort one another. Hebrews ten twenty four and twenty five. Consider one another. Galatians 6.2, bear ye one another's burdens. James 5.16, pray for one another. What do you think of those passages? Aren't they potent? So, go ahead, Russ. It's almost, that's exactly what Christ does for us. Exactly. So, so you know, when someone's suffering, so when someone is suffering... Hey, son, be, be, don't, don't keep sticking <laughs> in people's minds. Keep it like here. When someone is suffering, you know, Christ is looking at you to, you know, be Christ to him. You know, your life should, you know, reflect, you know, what he does for you or how you, he treats you. So. Would you agree with that, that this is talking about the life of Christ been seen in us and through us? Um, 
Okay, so we looked at care for one another. How does, how does all these look like practically? I mean, guys, you're reading what I'm reading tonight. Go ahead, Curtis. I like the one, uh... <laughs> Is it prefer one another? Because I'm in business, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we'll get bids from other people, but if I know a guy's a believer, does that mean I should uh, maybe give him favor, you know, maybe let him win the bid, even though he might be a little more expensive or <laughs> give him some favor there? But yeah, I think uh, I do believe that, though. I mean, if I know that, um, I'm trying to think of an example, because we've done this in the past with, if we're going to buy something, and let's say there's two individuals, but I know the one's a Christian, mm-hmm. I will I will uh, give my money to the born again Christian mm-hmm. and prefer them, uh, not not because you know it's it's any better than the other person, but because they're the believer. So mm-hmm. uh, just stuff like that. I, I that that really kind of touches home for me. Amen, Curtis, or um, Cameron. Sorry. One that really hit um, really hits me is forbear one another. I mean, none of us are perfect, perfect in here. We all have downfalls. We all have failures. We fall, we get up, we fall, we get up, we fall, we get up, we fall, we get up. Forbear one another. Bear with one another. I mean, give, give your brother mercy, grace. Here, let me give you an example of what Cameron's talking about. Brother Clendenin, that old preacher, you've heard me talk about him. Um, he used to be in early in the morning, 7 o'clock every morning. He would come in, he would like to get in early-ish, just get in his office, get a bit of quiet time. And he says, as sure as can be, there was this guy, let's call his name Willie, okay? Willie was there every day. And Willie would ask him all these questions. He was there before he could even get started his work. And he, Brother Clinton said it just annoy his head. And he would just go on and on and on. And it's just like, oh, I just want to get, get do my duties for the day. So Brother Clinton got before the Lord. And he started to pray, Lord, just move Willie out of the way. You know, just he's, he's annoying my head. And, and he asked the Lord a question. Lord, when, when are you going to stop Willie coming every morning to annoy my head? And do you know what the Holy Ghost said to him when he stops annoying you? When he stops annoying you. And I'm telling you, sometimes it's more of what God's doing with us. Because God's, he's trying to, the Lord's trying to get, give us a heart of self-denial, of just holy living, like be in his hands, his feet, and his voice. Does that make sense? But So I, I think we think, oh, I'm all them there. I I can get 10 out of 10 for all them baloney. Baloney. I, we fall short. But you see, when it comes to revival, we need to see this is where he's wanting us. Uh, we'll go to Peter and then Jesse. I was going to say, um, just along the lines where um, Ross mentioned, um, that... There's a danger of just uh, reading those commands in isolation. Um, uh, like I like what uh, Augustine uh, shared uh, in his prayer that give what you command, O Lord, and then command whatever you will. Say that again. Give what you command, O Lord, and then command whatever you will. Oh. Uh, that behind every command, there is a power. Yeah. Uh, power to enable us to do that. Uh, and that power is the power of the gospel. Yeah. Like the gospel enables us to follow through that, realizing that Christ has loved us even when we were in sin unlovable. Uh, you know, and we have uh, a desire in us to love others because he loved us. You know, and so like, I mean, uh, for me personally, just uh, keeping in, in mind that, you know what, the power to do those commands comes from God, yes. and it's actually the gospel of Christ that uh, enables me to follow through and to do, do that with joy, yes. with peace, not out of duty yes. or performance, yes. but out of a pure, genuine love for Christ mm-hmm. so that others can see Christ through me. Absolutely. I think one of the things we do need to pray for is, Lord, give me your heart. 
I think if we are carrying his heart, we can feel compassion for the lost. If we've got his heart, would you agree we've got compassion for our brethren? Um, the problem is we get so used with us. Well, me being me, that we just we actually get in the way of it for years. Where we just we don't really care. We hear the prayer request. We read the prayer requests on the on the thing, but it's sometimes we pray, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we care, most times we don't. And I'm telling you honestly, I'm just saying we have to fight self every day. And what I'm saying is, as I was looking at these today, I'm like, you you can put your own life and go down these one by one, and and say, is that me? And I want to just quote a verse that Curtis... Okay, Curtis made a point about fellow believers, okay? So I want to give you a scripture for that just to support what you're saying. Um, could we go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 10? And Curtis, maybe you could read it tonight. Um, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Guys... Isn't that a powerful passage? I do believe I do believe that we should favor believers over unbelievers. How do you feel about that? Now, I, I get it. Okay, you say, well, what if I'm about to buy a car and it's 14000 with this guy who's a believer, but this unbeliever's doing it 12500 Well, okay, I get your point, okay? But you could maybe talk the believer down to 12500 do you understand? I, I do feel that there is that sense of the brethren should look out for the brethren. What do you feel about that? Or do you just you just go for the best deal? Well, there's an ethical part. Like for my business, so, uh, like let's say <laughs> I get in a couple bids and, uh, you know, Kyle, Kyle put in a bid, but this other guy, you know, put in a bid. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, it can be unethical for me to go to Kyle and say, hey, man, you know, this guy was nine thousand. You were ten. Like, yeah. hey, cut your number down to nine, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll we'll make it happen. So you gotta you gotta be a little bit careful. But I do believe that. I do agree. Uh, we should like uh, if my kid goes to public school and Miss Reed is the teacher. I hope that uh, she would show favoritism, even though you know I know she's not supposed to. But uh, we should look out for one another. I agree with that one hundred percent. So, yeah. and uh, and guys, I'm not talking about maybe in the workplace we are bound by rules. But in our personal life, we do call the shots. Um, Elijah, just, just real quick on that. Like, sometimes you find, sometimes you find, like even Christian companies, like compared to like other secular companies. I know this is just a little bit more, a little bit more out there. But sometimes it's better to pay a little bit more for a product that's going to go for someone who knows how to manage the money, and a Christian organization who's actually going to do stuff for the kingdom. Than just give it to a you know a secular company who's going to do it for secular things, so you can't always do that, but it is something to keep in mind with that you know. Okay, here's a question, guys, because um, how do we bear one another's burdens? Sherry, see, it's it's one thing reading this and amen in this, but how does this look practically? Okay, maybe I'm going to be too transparent here. But I, and I, maybe I just need personal revival, but everything that we have been going through and we're going through, Abby had brought up a good point. And this is not God's design. This is so not God's design for divorce, for single mamas, for the elderly to go into nursing homes. I don't believe that's God's design. Mm -hmm. But never before, she said in history, have our generation had to take care of our parents, our kids, our grandparents, our, our grandkids. So we are, we tend to carry their burden. Why we still have a burden for our church family, why we still have a burden for the lost. And mm. sometimes I honestly don't know how to dissect that if that's the right word to use maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm the only one feeling this way no that okay so here's a real life scenario there there's some there's a point been made here that i don't think we can ignore the day we're living in there's so many grandparents are actually raising or semi raising the the, the grandkids is that god's order 
No, and but is there a responsibility in the grandparents if the if the kids aren't looking after them to stand in the gap, basically? So the, the, there's the challenge of our day, and then there's a reality that we have to deal with. So I, I think one of the negatives is that we're having to deal with the generation we're living in. Um, I personally, I don't believe it's God's God's perfect will. Okay, so the, a couple has kids. Their duty is to look after those kids. Okay, it's not happening today. Um, and a lot of time, you've got a mother maybe raising a child, which is has become pretty normal. Where's the father? The fathers aren't there. They're playing the field. They're playing games. So, I. I I think we're living in an awful wicked day and we we have to function in that wicked day. We can live in denial. We're not living there. We'll just live in denial. No, we have a responsibility to our blood family, but we have a responsibility to our church family. Uh, I know for me that one of, one of the tough things for me is your kids get grow up. They start to have a lot of things on, whether it's like last night, we had a concert. The night before, we're playing soccer. There's like something else on. There's a track meet coming up. And before you know it, you're like, you're running 90 mile an hour. And then graduations come and you're like, <laughs> one of the things that happens is somewhere in the midst of it, God loses out. The people of God lose out. The house of God loses out. And I don't know. I just, it's a hard day to be a pastor as well. Because you're you're living in that day, and I feel like I'm putting people on a legalistic guilt trip. You know, you need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to be in the house of the Lord. And they're like, sometimes, you know, I'm like, that's not my place as a pastor. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. Do you, here, here's a thought. What do you think would happen tonight? If at 6.30, if somebody come to my house and they wanted to talk to me tonight for like an hour, what, what, what do you think I would have done? I would have first of all brought them to Bible study and said, hey, we'll talk afterward. Okay. I am not going to miss the house of God. Okay. I'm telling you, we're living in a day where that is not, it's just, it's different. And I feel like I'm a legalistic pastor today just saying like, you need to be in the house of the Lord. Now, here's the only thing that helps me. When, when I was single, when I was not a pastor, I was in the house of the Lord. So it wasn't just because I'm a pastor that I'm trying to put you on a guilt trip. If you think Pastor McConnell would have came over here to the Indian Reservation for 10 days, that if I w was not a committed member of the church, do you think he would have come over if I was just, I just turned up willy-nilly to church? Do you think he would have come over, give 10 days of his life to that there, and basically minister to this place? I mean, what's the odds of that? That guy can go anywhere. And I'm, I'm saying that, that he could, you know, but I'm telling you that one thing I learned from Pastor McConnell is that God's number one. Of course, families comes in there after that. But I'm telling you, he taught me the importance of the house of God, the work of God, the God himself. So, hey, I'm just trying to encourage you tonight that we're living in a different day. Okay, would you agree? In that day, anything goes. You see, if you, if you compare yourself to the average Christian, how do you think you'll look today? The average Christian out there. How do you think you'll look? Com extreme? On all these things, here you'll look like a super duper, like 9 out of 10 Christian. Would you agree? Because a lot of Christians go to church and they're not, I mean, Okay, am I being cynical? Do you think most Christians out there today are doing this here? Are they even close enough to their brother and sister to get away with that? Cindy, am I being cynical? Or do you, I'm saying, 
let's say we lived in Sioux City. Do you think in the big churches there that they really know each other? I, I, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the big churches now have what they call life groups and stuff on like Wednesday nights, you know, where the, they, they get together, you know, and they, you know, like you say, meet in different, not just in one house, but I mean, they, like eight families. They switch groups. Yeah, so they, they, they try to, they try to bind, you know, get them more involved in each other and, and uh, committed to each other and helping each other and, you know. So I, I talked to somebody a year and a half ago who went to a church in Sioux City. Okay. The congregation was about 1,500. How many actually went to the midweek? They, they went to the midweek. Out of that 1,500, how many went to the midweek service? 50. Now, my point is that there is a committed few in every church. There's a dedicated few. I'm just saying what, what, I, what I grew up with, like I'm 57, so I can remember back to I was four. So I can think back 53 years, maybe before that. Um, I can remember back then, going to a Pentecostal church, and I'm telling you, the midweek was packed, the prayer meeting was packed, evangelism was packed, everything was packed, everybody was on fire, it was just, there was a move of God. I think things have changed in my lifetime, that they cared for each other. If somebody, if somebody died, the whole church family was gathering around them, um, hey, what can we do for you? Okay, we, the ladies are going to do this, the men are going to do this. I remember that. I'm talking about, I'm talking every day to people now, and their story is, I don't even know those people I go to church with. I, I hear a sermon, I like the sermon, but I don't really know anyone, and I'm like, well, you should know people. So I'm not doing this out of a rant. I, I'm saying, I don't believe the church in our day is in revival. And I think that we've lost some, but I think there's something here that just gives us a few nuggets what, where we're meant to be, where the church is meant to be generally. Kyle, have you any thoughts on that? Or, I mean, you guys talk to people out there like me. I mean, any thoughts on this subject? Well, I think uh, everybody falls short with the first commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind. Some passages are thy strength. Um, it probably isn't, I, I say this often, it isn't a, it's certainly Sunday, we want to be there Sunday, but it isn't Sunday and Tuesday, it's really every day, and every, every person has to make a decision, we all make decisions, now that we're born again, we can make a decision, we have the ability to make a decision, we have, we have the ability to make a decision and ask for help, mm -hmm. so are we going to serve the Lord that day, not only Sunday and Tuesday, but Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, and be close to Him? and love him more. Like I told somebody the other day, you know, uh, somebody's looking for a husband or whatever. I said, you know, I said, somebody not here outside, I said, you know, they're, they're 50 years old or whatever. They got 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe they got 50 more years. Maybe they'll be 100. But after that, you're going to be dead. And the Bible says you're not even, they don't marry or given in marriage. The only thing, the only focus is the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the focus for most people here in about 30 or 40 years. So what are you doing every day of your life? Are you loving him? Are you close to him? Is he your first thing when you get up? And do you read his word? And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know how much time you should be reading. You know, if it's a half a chapter, chapter, five chapters, praying for five minutes or 15 minutes. I don't know. Um, but, you know, the Bible talks about just being in that, that uh, thought process all the day long. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some days, just every once in a while uh, during the year, where I sit back and I say, boy, a couple hours have just went by and I wasn't thinking of anything. You ever kind of have blanked out like that for a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're not to be like that. We're to be in the, the thought process of the Lord and thinking of Him. And, and you know, I'm not saying you're reading or praying every second of the day, but your life is in that process, how you do your business, how you act. Everything you do is about the Lord and who you are in the Lord. Yeah, you have standards and practices and ethical things, just like Curtis said, in business and things. But ultimately, you're, you're, you're the Lord's and you're to act like his child and to be thinking about him and operating in his kingdom. Amen. Yeah. 
So, hey, let's just close it up tonight with this. There could be someone tonight in our church that's really struggling. You'd like to think that if the Spirit's moving in our church, that we should be sensitive to that need. Would you agree? That's all I'm talking about. I don't think 30 people need to call that one person. But how about one person? Maybe somebody needs a visit. You know, we're living in a day where it's this year's... In fact, this is not what we do. What, what do we do most of the time if we want to see how somebody is? Text, how's it going? Um, we've got, we've cut in so many corners today that um, I'm just saying sometimes people need more than a text. Sometimes they need a phone call. Sometimes they need a visit. And I'm just asking you, okay, just because technology has changed doesn't mean ministry has changed. We use, ministry, we use technology for the glory of God, but that should allow us to reach more people. So I just want to in, encourage you, in the midst of what Sherry said, what Sherry described is reality, not imaginations. And so here's the two thoughts. In regard to the reality of that there's a norm today out there. In, in regard to that, and in regard to the fact technology is phenomenal today. How are we functioning in regard to those two things? Are we genuinely functioning in all this? Or have we just started to cut corners and take the easy route and then we think that that's enough when then the bottom line is it's not enough? There's single people in this church, okay? And in case you forget what it was like to be single, sometimes... You married people should be following up those single people just to encourage them. Because I've been single and you've been single. I lived on my own for nine years, okay? I left my mom's house. I lived in a house. And I tell you, every so often you appreciate the phone call or somebody coming around to visit you. So I'm just challenging you just to be mindful of of what we have in this church, and if you do have a moment, how about, well, yeah, see the bottom one there? How about comforting one another? Maybe somebody has, is in bereavement. I Listen, there's people in this church, okay, are in bereavement. I, I believe that um, Evan and Mary are still going through grave bereavement. They still need comfort. I, I believe Ruth at the back, she comes on a Sunday. Do you ever see Ruth that... that she lost her husband like about five months ago. And through that, she ended up coming to this church. She's broken. Every day she misses her husband. She's got no kids. She misses her husband. Um, so all the big dates come along. The birthdays come along. Christmas comes along. Thanksgiving comes along. People, you know, people are missing people. So I'm just trying to, in some way, just, Maybe we all need a reminder. We need to just think, think outside our own little box. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we just thank you for your word. Lord, this sword uh, cuts both ways. Lord, as we get into these topics, we're all reminded how far we fall short. Lord, I believe that we're here for revival. I believe we're here to fulfill your blueprint, not our own blueprint. Not the church's blueprint, but your biblical blueprint. And Lord, we first of all minister unto you. I believe secondly, we minister unto the body. And I believe it's then that we minister unto the lost. Lord, if we are not producing the goods in here, how can we bring this good news to a fallen world? So Lord, we know that how will they know that we are your disciples, that we love one another. I pray that the love of Christ would be shed abroad in our hearts, that you would shine brightly in this house. And Lord, I pray that this house and the church that we represent, O oh God, Lord, that we would just give this generation hope. Lord, that there is another way. We don't need to conform to this world. Lord, that we don't even need to conform to the, Lord, what's out there today. Lord, there, I feel there's a lot of misrepresentation of you out there today. Lord, we fall short, but... Lord, we, I just say that I pray that we would be a good reflection of you. Whatever you want us to do this week, I pray that we would be sensitive, number one, 
and then willing number two. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Give us journey and mercies as well as we travel home. Amen.